Welcome back to another episode of PJs and Stories. Thank you for tuning in to PJs and Stories tonight. And welcome to PJs and Stories. Welcome to PJs and Stories. What is up, Pursuit family? This is our special guest, the Stanley Blue Jay, and my name is Abby, and I'm the Connections Coordinator here at The Pursuit, and we are looking forward to this experience today. <laughs> I'm like, hold on, we gotta start over. <laughs> I'm like, I like, scared what? Okay. Yeah. This is our special guest, the Stanley Mascot Blue Jay. We couldn't be happier to have you joining us this morning. If you guys don't know, we are a multi-campus church, and obviously things look differently nowadays, but Stanley and Minot is where we hold our services, and we're just looking forward to having this guy here with us. Um, do you want to reveal what's underneath the hood? Dun, dun, dun. It it's is. me! Introduce yourself. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Like Abby said, I uh, the Stanley Blue Jay. Um, my name's Jesse, and I am the campus pastor over in Stanley. And I thought we'd just start off with a little fun this morning. I love and, fun. Yeah, and if you can't take the mascot of, of our town, you know, seriously, I, know. I mean, I don't know. Uh, we need to get the Minot Magi in here, I think. Hey, Maybe. so it has been such a beautiful week. The weather has been amazing. Are you burning up in there? It's a little warm. I just want you Stanley people to know what I do for you. It is hot, so let me let me see if I can help you out a little bit with this. How do you feel? A million times better. <laughs> I bet you are. A little bit cooler in this outfit, I will say that. So. so, okay, if you're just tuning in, my name is Abby, and I'm the Connections Coordinator. And my name's Jesse, and I'm the campus pastor over in Stanley. And we're really looking forward to this experience that we have today for you guys. And we like to keep things fun and light. So throughout the pre-service, we want to play a little trivia game with you. We have a couple questions that we'll be asking. Um, and just 
post in the comments what you think your answer is and at the end of service we will be collecting who has the most correct answers and just to throw this out there we want you guys to be honest yes. no using your phones and googling the answers to these you got to be on the spot if you know them or not all right so go ahead and ask our first trivia question all right we got here's the first one for you guys out there <clears throat> What is the tiny hard piece at the end of a shoelace called? So I don't know what that is, but we will be giving the answer in just a moment. Um, I know that with things looking different nowadays, our community groups look completely different, but hey, they are still happening. So if this is your first time ever tuning on, we recommend that you get connected with our online groups. We have awesome opportunities for you to meet people to to go through and have relationships with other people um, talk about things that are happening in your life and dig into scripture jesse tell me what your online group has been looking like uh, it's different. <laughs> Not gonna lie, like if you've ever haven't tried them before, but we use uh, my couples group that I'm a part of right now. Uh, we use Zoom as our main platform of how we communicate, and so it's been great. You know, through the time, I'm I'm so thankful that there's technology that makes it available, so we can still meet and connect, and that's really the big thing because through this whole COVID nineteen season that a lot of us have been going through, you know, it, it's easy to feel lonely. It's easy to feel attached and like no one's there for you but the great thing about doing online groups is that you don't have to experience that you know you can still connect and have those fruitful relationships just in a different platform my online group has been such a blessing for me and it's kind of a joke in our house that we used to have alexa listening to us all the time google home and now every single person that's on my kids zoom calls my <laughs> zoom call there's always a zoom meeting happening at mm -hmm. our house hey why don't you tell us what the answer of this trivia question is okay so the question I'll just read the question one more time it was what is the tiny hard piece at the end of a shoelace called and the answer to that if you've been following along is uh, anglet anglet a-g-l-e-t anglet -E so the next question we have for you is what is the first toy ever advertised on the television that's a good one. So a very good one. we love personal invites. If you came to church here at the Pursuit before the COVID lockdown, we were always giving out personal invite cards, inviting people. And one thing that we could ask you to do right now for us is still give that personal invite by sharing this. If you're on Facebook or YouTube, oh. share this and tag a friend that you would love to see. Our current sermon series is lies that my pastor has told me yes so if you have somebody that you feel like could really benefit off of this please invite them and share this and get the word out we love um, we love hearing all the places that the pursuit is reaching nowadays we really have um, it's a worldwide honestly absolutely um, so we can just reach the gospel in so many different places of the world right now with this being online yeah absolutely i think abby you hit it on the head there that you know each of us have a specific circle of people and you know you might know people that i don't know and vice versa so when we go out and we're able to share uh, this online experience with everyone you're exposing it to a whole new group of people and then maybe they share it too so there's so many benefits of being able to do that yes so if you are just now logging on my name is Abby and this is Jesse and we are playing a fun trivia game the question I just asked is what was the first ever first toy ever advertised on television and that was the mr. potato head in 1952 do you have a mr. potato head or did you I'm sure you don't have one now I don't I know still but play you did, with one Abby you, you did no. come in in a blue jay costume you never know you never know uh, no actually growing up I don't remember ever having a Mr. Potato Head. No? What'd yeah. you do for fun? <laughs> I played with a stick and a wheel. No, I'm kidding. No, I lived on a farm. I actually, I was outside. I uh, did a lot of things outside. I did have action figures like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and some G.I. Joes and Transformers, but no Mr. Potato Head. So. Yeah, hit us with our next question. All right, next question that I have is how many kinds of apples are growing around the world? Whoa. 
That's a big question. Mm. <laughs> so obviously we love to do fun things. Um, and if you're unaware, we have our youth program called momentum momentum and it is still happening um mm. just like our online groups our youth momentum team has been working so hard at keeping the word of god out and mm. alive in our youth and this next wednesday they will be doing a drive-in small group um at seven o'clock so if you're unfamiliar of our website it's the pursuit.church um we will have information posted about that but i i I want you guys to invite your friends and meet up at the church. Um, it will be a fun way to get together um, and still practice social distancing, but uh, just to keep our our youth gathering together. Oh, absolutely. I think I think especially the young people, you know, not being around your friends. I mean, obviously, we know in the summertime that happens, but, you know, just starting early like this, yeah. I mean, that can be really tough for them. So having an opportunity like this, yeah, where we're still practicing social distancing, but at the same time, we're still able to get them together and connect. So I think that's that's awesome what our, what our youth director is doing here. And with it warming up outside, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, I, I'm sure everybody just wants to be outside. So I'm sure we're going to see my not getting a little busier but mm -hmm. um it's still important to practice our social distancing so okay your trivia question was how many types of apples are there around the world how many kinds of apples are growing around the world and the answer is seven thousand five hundred wow that's pretty crazy <laughs> <laughs> our next question is what is the most common birthday in the united states what is your birthday jesse April 12th, actually. I got the double whammy this year on Easter and my birthday. Nice. So. Next week is my birthday, April 30th. So you got, a, you got a huge party plan? I don't. And, you know, last year I celebrated in a big way. It was my big golden birthday. I turned 30. I, there you go. Now everybody knows my age. <laughs> but um, so I think it will be nice to just stay at home this year because I don't mm -hmm. have an option. <laughs> Fair enough. So, Jesse, um, if if somebody was looking for some prayer, what could what could they do to connect with us? There's a few different ways uh, that you can connect with us. Just one is uh, in the comments here, our, our team that, that does an amazing job uh, posting like scriptures and whatnot, they'll have a link in there that'll be for a prayer request. And so if you're going through anything right now, I just want to really strongly encourage you, you know, you don't have to do that alone. You know, if there's something that you need prayer for, just click on that link and it'll go to our prayer team. And we have prayer teams here and in Stanley that would just love to, they have a passion for it. That's their gifting is to, to pray for you. So that's one way. And, and another thing that we do that's very encouraging during the week is on Tuesdays, uh, both here in Minot and in Stanley, we have our different leaders and staff that get online and they do a prayer and devotional as well. So if you need a, a pick me up or a little, a little something during the week to encourage you, I just, uh, I just want to encourage everyone out there to, to check out our Facebook page on Tuesdays and, and hear that uh, prayer and devotional as well. Yeah. I've been really enjoying the prayer and devotional on Tuesdays. Um, it's just a quick word of encouragement uh, that just keeps keeps light of the situation that's happening. But like you said, we have people who love to pray and they're wanting to pray with you. So if you're going through something, let us know. So, okay, the most common birthday in the United States is September 9th. So if that is your birthday, let us know. I want to see how many people we have this September 9th birthday. Yeah, I would be. I'd be curious to know that too. <laughs> so hey, if you're just now tuning in, my name is Abby, and my name is Jesse. And go ahead and share our um, our experience that we have happening today. Our service. We would love to get the word out with others and maybe give them a personal invite. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, what's our next trivia question? Okay, our next one that we got here. <clears throat> What is a group of toads called? A group of toads. A group of toads. What are they called? <laughs> So we also have an amazing kids ministry that is happening. We do PJs and stories and our kids ministry has been putting together a ministry and a box that you can come and pick up at our uh, Minot campus. And then it is put, the lesson is posted on YouTube for you to watch and enjoy God's word with your kids. It gives them something fun to do. My family has been enjoying it. Uh, my kids love doing it. So if you're interested in joining our kids ministry, uh, 
ministry in a box go ahead and comment below and we'll get you in contact with somebody to be able to pick up your own box absolutely and just one other thing too that we want to talk about uh this week too is some of you might not know but the pursuit we actually have a podcast that happens every single week and this last wednesday was one a very lighthearted one but it was all about extroverts and introverts which i think is uh <laughs> during what we're going through right now is we had some extroverts that are just uh itching to get dying. back outside <laughs> dying uh, or dying <laughs> as as abby wants to put it um <laughs> but I, also too you know the introverts have been like i've been practicing for this my whole life i'm ready for this covid19 right now um, but it was a really fun conversation with our staff members brianna and nick and and they got to just dive into that subject so i just want to encourage you um you know if you go to youtube and you search for the pursuit church You'll be able to listen to those podcasts, and I think we have about four that we've done so far. We've done five so far. I've just been corrected. Uh, <laughs> but we have five, and I just encourage you, they're, they're all on different topics and subjects, and, and it would be very, I think, a blessing to you if you have some spare time and want to listen to it. Yeah, and everything that we have is available on our Facebook, um, on our website, thepursuit.church, and we upload majority of our things onto our YouTube page, so mm -hmm. those are great spots to go. We would love to connect with you please connect with us um, we have a free virtual gift that we want to give to you if this is your first time tuning on and jesse what is the answer to our i last know we can't we, we can't we can't get off here without this so a group of toads is called a knot a knot. A knot. Wow. Is a group of toads. Never heard of that before. Well, hey, as we transition into our worship, um, I am just so looking forward to this, and I'm so thankful that you guys have joined us today. Jesse, do you have any last words of encouragement for us? Man, I do, like we've been talking about, share this with the friends. And, and and just because like right now, I think we all need something that's like an encouragement. And the messages that we've been hearing, especially, you know, in this topic of lies that my pastor told, they're so powerful. And I think the, the messages have uh, in, the potential to reach and impact lots of definitely. people. So definitely share this uh, this link. Yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Well, hello, church family. We're so excited to get a chance to worship with you today. Let's stand wherever we are in our homes, in our bedrooms, in our kitchens, in our living rooms. Let's stand together. Let's worship the risen King. Come on.
Show. 
crazy season that we find ourselves in sometimes it's hard not to get discouraged sometimes it, it it feels like we're lonely like we're isolated but isn't it good to know that we serve a God who's closer than a brother we serve an incredible God that's our friend what a friend we have in him that when everything else falls apart around us we can lean into him and he, he promised to never leave us and never forsake us so as we continue this time of worship, let's sing this song, What a Friend We Have. I've never heard you sing. What have you done for me lately? What have you done to my grave? I've never heard you speak. Anything but your love for me. Anything but I did.
And you're more than enough You've been my shelter Thank you for tuning in with us today for service. We're so glad you decided to come spend about an hour or so of your time with us. And I don't know where you're at, whether it's at home, in your living room, in your kitchen, in your office, maybe you're just listening on the road. But what's really cool is that even though we can't see each other, is that we are gathering corporately and God's encouraging us all. And I wanna encourage you to make sure you stay connected in this season, whether you are struggling of how to give your kids something meaningful to do each week to live out their faith and learn and grow or maybe you're feeling isolation and you need to find some community if you go to the pursuit.church we have a lot of tools there that are available for you to engage with others and stay connected which is going to be a huge part of making it through this season well and i want to encourage you if you are new to the pursuit or maybe this is your first time tuning in or you never made yourselves known, we have a number that you can text the word connect to and we would love to give you a free digital gift and just see how we can serve you in this season and help you navigate whatever's going on and be the church for you. So that number is going to be either on the screen or in the comments. Check that out. But we're going to transition to the giving moment that we do each week in service. And so I have a couple verses that I want to share with you to encourage you today. And we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And the first verse I want to read to you is from verse 7. It says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And the truth is, in order for us to live out our faith, we have to do that through giving. And it's not just financial giving. When we pray for others, we're giving. When we serve others, we're giving. In order to live the faith that God calls us to live, we just have to give. But sometimes we forget to invite God into that process. 
There's a lot of needs and things we can do to live our, our faith that we can just do and we don't have to ask God. This week, my wife and I were talking and there's a, a dear friend of ours that's going through a tough situation and Annie made the statement and she, just, she said, hey, what do you think about um, giving financially to this friend in need that's in a hard spot? And I was challenged because I think a lot of times we just meet the need and so what we did is we decided, hey, let's pray about it for two days because we can give something but let's ask God what he wants to give in the situation and invite him into the situation. And so many of us that do regular giving, our giving is on autopilot, or some of us have never given before. And so I wanna challenge you today, even if you're a regular giver, invite God into the season on what he wants you to give. It may be different, it may be new, it may be um, a unique thing for you, um, but let's invite God into it. If you've never given before, I would encourage you to ask God what he would ask for you to give. Giving is just a part of our faith and as we give, it allows us to keep growing closer to Jesus. And then I wanna encourage you before we close today with the second verse, verse eight in 2 Corinthians chapter nine, it says, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. No matter what you're going through today, no matter what challenges you're facing, we have a God who is good and he's gonna meet us where we're at and make sure we have everything we need. I hope that was encouraging for you today and I would just repeat the challenge that let's invite God into the situations where whether we're giving financially or giving our time to others or serving others, invite God in the equation. And with that being said, let's turn to today's message for week two of Lies My Pastor Told Me and hear what Tom has to teach us. Welcome to The Pursuit Online. I'm so excited you're joining us. Um, and welcome to day 300 of the month of April. This has been a crazy, crazy season. I don't know what it's been like for you, if it's been really challenging, or if it's just been like Groundhog's Day, or maybe you've been experiencing victories in your life, but we've all been going through something so unprecedented. And I can tell you that even though there's a lot of things that I can focus on and be frustrated about, um, I'm finding that God is blessing me with some simple joys. Um, we're getting extra time with our kids and being able to spend time with them and, and help them with homeschool, even though that's hard. <laughs> like, I got so much respect for, for all you teachers out there, but man, there's so many little blessings in this. And what I wanted to do before I jump into my message today is I wanted to just have an opportunity to hear from you. Um, I don't know what you're going through, but I want to ask if you are uh, near your comments, I want to hear from you in one word, describe your current mood. Um, how are you doing? What's going on? Like, get one word, how are you doing in this season? Go ahead and put it in right now. The word that I keep coming up with over and over again in my mind is the word antsy. I've been so antsy, like just Man, I feel so constricted and, and caged in, and I just got to praise the Lord here in North Dakota. We got some sunshine this past week so we could get outside, get some vitamin D. Um, I got out to go and get, go for a run and help fight back against that COVID-15, you know what I'm talking about? And I love this time of year for North Dakota because as soon as we get some sunny days, it's just like everybody just crawl, comes crawling out of their house. On one of my runs, I saw someone riding a horse. I saw people on four-wheel like you name it, just everybody was out getting stuff done. And I hope you're enjoying some of the sunshine and that in the middle of this season, you are experiencing and be able to see some of the blessings that are in the middle of it. But I'm glad you're joining us. In case we haven't met before, my name is Tom. And, uh, and, and I really believe that God's got something powerful for those of you who are tuning in today. Now, before I get into the message, could you do me a favor as well? Could you share the service on whatever social media platform, whether YouTube or whether Facebook Live, would you take a moment and just share this right now? Because you never know just who's going to tune in, who's, whose uh, news feed is going to come across and they'll get to tune in and God will bring them a message of hope and encouragement. So just take a moment right now, share the service, tag a friend. If there's someone you know needs to be tuning in right now, tag them in the comments and let them know that you'd love to have them join you at church today. Now, if you're just joining us, we are in the week two of a sermon series called Lies My Pastor Told Me. That's right. This sermon series is called Lies My Pastor Told Me. 
Now, just full disclosure, we're not picking on any pastor in particular. So any of the pastors of the churches that I've been a part of in the past, like I'm not talking about you. In fact, um, I might even be guilty of some of the statements or things that we're talking about. But here's the heart of this series, is that pastors and Christians will often tell people things about God and their relationship to him to encourage them. Now, much of the things that we say to others is helpful, but the truth is some of the things that we tell people are downright harmful. And so we want to explore some of those lies that maybe we have perpetuated in some way or another and get back to the heart of, of, of who God is and what his word says. Now, last week, week one, we jumped into one of the most famous statements that Christians say, which is really a lie. It's this, God won't give you more than you can handle. God won't give you more than you can handle. Maybe you've said it, maybe you've heard it said to you. And we talked about how that's really a lie because God would never give you a life that makes him unnecessary. And then we camped on this idea that maybe a better statement than God won't give you more than you can handle is that God won't give you more than he can handle. And it, as we closed out the service last week, it was so moving. I challenged you guys to, to make a declaration of I can't handle and then fill in the blank and then write, but I believe God can. And, and it was so moving to read through the comments. I'm telling you, it's like we made a virtual like holy ground as the comments just turn into people confessing and just declaring they believe that God could move in the middle of their tough circumstances. And if you missed that message, I would encourage you to go back and check it out. Now, this week, for lies my pastor told me, we're going to jump into this statement today. You don't have direct access to God. You don't have direct access to God. Now, I get to talk to a lot of different people as a pastor, and it's amazing to me how many people believe that there's some sort of barrier that's holding them back from having access to God. Now, I've never heard a pastor come out and outright say to someone, hey, you don't have direct access to God, but I'm, I'm led to believe that somewhere along the way as pastors, as Christians, we've said some things or, or implied some things where people get the impression that they are just not allowed to have access to God as they stand. So I want to ask the question, where does this lie come from? If I don't explicitly say that, or pastors don't explicitly say it, where does it come from? Well, here's where the lie is communicated. The lie is communicated when we as pastors and Christians tell people one of two things, and we can either say it explicitly or implicitly, and here's what they are. Number one, when we tell someone that you're not good enough, you're not good enough. I don't know if you're tuning in today, and maybe you don't feel like you have access to God because you just don't feel like you're good enough. Maybe someone told you that because of your, your, your sin struggles, because of your temptations, because of your past, that, that, that you are not good enough for God. Now, I've heard some bad stories at times where a pastor or a church leader will actually not allow someone to come into the church building because they either don't dress correctly or talk correctly or they're notorious for their lifestyle and the community. And what happens is because the church rejected them, they feel like God has rejected them. And consequently, they believe that I don't have access to God because I'm just not good enough. Maybe that's what you've experienced. And the second thing that we often will tell people that perpetuates this lie that people believe that you don't have access to God is that you don't know enough. You don't know enough. People often feel like there's a barrier between them and God because they don't know enough about the Bible, they don't know all the religious rules, they haven't been around the faith long enough, and so there's something incredibly intimidating where they feel inferior or almost like they're not allowed to approach God because they just don't know enough. I know a lot of people who won't even pray out loud out of fear of not doing it right. They're afraid that if they say the wrong words or, or don't just do it correctly, that somehow God is going to spite them or people will judge them. And so it's amazing how oftentimes when we feel like we don't know enough that we have some sort of barrier from connecting with God. Now, I remember as a, as a young Christian, um, I went to a, a Christian college and I was uh, I hardly knew anything about my faith. I was eager to learn. I was jiving into God's word, but I really wanted to go to a, a Christian school to learn more about what it means to follow Jesus. And I remember walking onto that college campus as a brand new Christian, and I felt so intimidated. 
I felt so intimidated because all these students and faculty had been walking with Jesus for so many years. They knew all the right words to say. They knew all the lingo. And here I was, this brand new follower of Jesus that could barely, you know, um, find where the book of Matthew was in the New Testament, right? Like, I just, I, I don't know if you've, you've had that experience, but I think sometimes we feel like because we don't know enough that there's a barrier between us and God. But I want to make a statement. I want to be very clear to those of you who are listening today. Some of you need to hear this. In Christ, nothing can block your access to God. Let me say that again. In Christ, nothing can block your access to God. If you've put your faith in Jesus, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, guess what? You have absolutely direct access to God. And by the way, nobody's saved because they're good enough. In fact, the Bible teaches us that none of us are good enough, but because of God and what he did on the cross, he makes us good enough by his sacrifice. Um, You don't have to be, you know, a a perfect person for God to accept you. That's the the heart of the gospel, that in our brokenness, God died for us and created us a way to him. Also, by the way, if you're a brand new Christian and you know very little about the Bible, guess what? You have the same access to God as the professor at the seminary or the pastor in the pulpit. You have no less access access to God based on your education level in the faith. Now, I'm not I'm saying that education is not important. I think one of the most important things that we do as Christ followers is we continue to grow in our knowledge of knowing and, and getting to, to know Jesus. But when you first start your faith to when you finish your faith, you have the same access to God. The cross of Christ is the great equalizer. That if you've been covered by the blood of Jesus, whether you've been walking with him for 30 years or whether just this morning you confessed your sin and received the free gift of salvation, you have the same exact access to him. Now, I love this scripture, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12. Let me pull it up in my Bible here. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12. It says this, in him, talking about Jesus, and through faith in him, Check this out right here. We may approach God with freedom and confidence. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Freedom means that you have unrestricted access. There's no restrictions. You're completely free to approach God whenever you want. And I love the second word. It says with confidence. Maybe, you, you, you know, you, you have a, some insecurities because you don't feel like you're good enough or you don't feel like you know enough. Guess what? You can approach God with confidence because that's not, that's not a barrier. That's amazing truth. That in him and through him, we, have, we can approach God with freedom and confidence. Now, before Christ came, this wasn't the case. Before Christ came, access to God's presence was, was restricted. People, if you read the New Testament, or the Old Testament, excuse me, people needed someone to mediate between them and God. You see, before Christ came, before he died on the cross, was buried and rose from the dead, God had appointed a group of people to, be, to act as priests, to be mediators, the go-between, the bridge between God and people. You know, we couldn't, before Jesus, just walk into the presence of God. The access was absolutely restricted, and so God appointed priests to be the go-between. They would be consecrated, they'd be set apart, and they would represent us to God and God to us, and, and, and that's just how it worked. Now, why did we need a priest? Why did we need a priest before Jesus came? This is really important, because God is holy, and we are not. God is holy and we are not. In fact, the Bible teaches us that God's presence is so pure and so holy that unless you have been purified or consecrated, you can't go into it without risking death. Now, I remember there's a story in the Old Testament, the prophet Elijah, um, he, he finds himself in the presence of God, and instantly he says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, surely I will die. Like, he was just so scared that he found himself in the presence of God, and of course, you know, God purified him. And then the Mo- Moses, right, famous Moses in the Old Testament, 
God said, I want to reveal my glory to you, Moses, but my glory is so much that you need to hide in the cleft of the rocks on the mountain, and you can't look into my face, because if you look into my face, you will surely die. You see, our sin is what prevented us from having direct access to God. Now, in the ancient world, I want you to think about this illustration. Um, you know, you know we, don't, we don't think of it much in these ways, but a, a king in his kingdom, a common person couldn't just walk uninvited into the presence of a king without risking his life or her life. Unless you were summoned by the king, like you couldn't just barge into the king's uh, quarters as a commoner and just sort of start talking to the king. He'd go, what in the world are you doing here? Off with your head, right? Like like there was a sanctity, there was a reverence that people were to bring like to the king. And how much more before Jesus did we have to honor that, that he's the king of kings? We can't just approach his presence without him inviting us in, making a way for us to come into His presence. And like I said, before Jesus came, our sin is what prevented us from having direct access to God. But I love this, is that God, in his love for us, he set up a system of worship where his presence could dwell among his people, but yet it would be shielded from his people at the same time. And so he built a system of worship that was around a tabernacle and a temple and priests. And it was, it was a way for God's people to sort of be around the presence of God without coming face to face with the presence of God. And so God had priests go as the in-between. They facilitated worship. They would be the mediator between God and people. And that's how, that's how the worship system functioned. Now, I want to read this in in Hebrews chapter 9. The author of Hebrews described the system of worship that God created in the Old Testament before Jesus came. And here's what it says in Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 1. It said, now the first covenant, now if you read the Bible, it's often divided into Old Covenant, New Covenant, Old Testament, New Testament. And it says, in the first covenant or the Old Covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. Now, it says, a tabernacle was set up. In its first room, there were were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. And then in verse 6, it says, when everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered into the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people the people had committed in ignorance. So here's what worship looked like before Jesus. The Israelites put up this tent called the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was basically like a mobile church. They would set it up wherever God had him camping him, and it was made up of two rooms. There was the holy place and the most holy place. Now, the holy place was the outer room, and that was where priests did their regular daily activities of facilitating worship. They would put out the consecrated bread. They would make sure the lamps were lit. They would do all their regular functions as priests. But then there was the inner room called the the holy of holies, the most holy place. And not anybody was allowed to go in there. Not even the priests could enter into the Holy of Holies. Now, the tabernacle, the only people allowed into the tabernacle were priests, not common Israelites. And so there was, like I said, there was the the outer room called the holy place, and that's where the the regular priests would do their, their ministry. But then there was that inner room called the Holy of Holies. Now, the Bible tells us that the Holy of Holies is where God's presence dwelt. And so nobody could just walk into that room because you know, the, the, the access was denied. There was the sinfulness and the holiness of God. And so they shielded the, the holy of holies with this curtain. And the, and the high priest was the only person who could go in there. And that was one time a year. And that one time a year was a special event in the nation of Israel called the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement was a national time of mourning and repentance the, the, the high priest would have to consecrate themselves. They would have to purify themselves. They would sacrifice a goat on their behalf. And then they would enter into the Holy of Holies. This is the only time that they would go into the Holy of Holies all year. And they would bring the shed blood 
of a goat, and they would sprinkle it onto the altar where God's presence dwelt. As they sprinkled this offering of blood, God would forgive them of their sins, thus creating a way for God and the people to continue to coexist, even though access was still restricted. Now, when Christ came, he ushered in a new covenant, in a new way of worship, and it changed everything. And so in the same chapters of Hebrews where it explains how the old way of worship functioned, it also says this in verse 11. It says, but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it's not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. You see, when Jesus came, he came as the perfect sacrifice. He came as the perfect high priest. And he entered in not through the earthly sanctuary, but it says he went into the eternal or the the heavenly sanctuary where his blood was, was poured out on the altar as he died on the cross. And it created a way for our sins to be forgiven. And that barrier that existed between us and God was completely removed in that one moment for all time. I love the wording in here. It says, thus obtaining eternal redemption. You see, when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, and he would sacrifice a goat on behalf of the nation of the Israel, it was a temporary cleansing. They'd have to go in there year after year after year to continue to make sure that they could maintain a right relationship with God. But when Jesus came as the perfect lamb of God, as the sacrifice, he was the one who secured our eternal redemption so that we don't need to bring a sacrifice again and again. God secured our redemption with his sacrifice. So powerful. And what Jesus did is he removed the spiritual barrier that existed between us and God, which was sin. They no longer needed to do that. Now, something really, really important to notice to this story is that there was a spiritual barrier that blocks people from just entering into God's presence, which was sin. And Jesus dealt with that when he died on the cross. But in the story, there's also a physical barrier that blocks people's access from God's presence. I don't even notice this. But this physical barrier that blocked the access of God's people into God's presence was the curtain. The curtain. There was a curtain in the old way of worship that separated the holy place from the most holy place. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 3. I don't know if you caught this. Here's what it says in verse 3. It says, behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place. Now this curtain was made of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, which of course was the colors of royalty, God being the king of kings, the the holy one, the pure one, so it was was made with those colors. And it said that on this um, curtain that separated the holy of holies from from, from the holy place, there was also cherubim embroidered into it. Now, the significance of the cherubim being embroidered into the curtain was cherubim often acted as guards denying access. That's what cherubim did. Think back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. Guess what? God put cherubim in front of the garden to deny and block access of Adam and Eve going back in him. And so this curtain, if anybody saw the curtain, it was this physical, visible reminder that you do not have access to God. It was such a a physical sign that you can't just walk into God's presence. There's a physical barrier that separates people from God. But I love this, is the moment that Jesus died on the cross, something extraordinary happened. And the Gospels give us this detail, and maybe you've read this before and you've wondered why this detail is in here. And here's what it says in Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. Now, Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he's about to die. And here's what it says. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, what does this mean? 
It means that Jesus not only removed spiritual barrier that existed between God and man, but he removed the physical barrier that separated God and man. This is so powerful. When Jesus died on the cross, I got a little, little visual for you. This is, this is my pretend curtain, okay? I wasn't going to embroider something, and I sure as heck wasn't going to put a real curtain on here and try to rip it in half. That would be, you know, beyond my physical strength and prowess. But I found this nice purple piece of construction paper that represents the curtain that would block the access between people and God. And when Jesus died on the cross, it says when he, when he gave up his, his, when his last breath, when, when, he, when, he, when he actually physically died, it said the curtain in the temple was torn in two. And what this means is that you and I now, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we can worship him anytime and anywhere. Anytime and anywhere, if you are in Christ, you can boldly approach the throne of grace because Jesus has removed all barriers between you and God. Guess what? You don't need a pastor to usher you into the presence of God. You don't even need a church building to usher you into the presence of God. In fact, in the New Testament, it says now as Christ followers, we worship God in spirit and in truth. You can worship him anytime, anywhere. Jesus, y'all, this is such good news. Jesus has removed all barriers between you and God. I thought about this, this whole idea. And if this is true, that when Jesus died on the cross and the temple curtain was, was torn in two, symbolizing how all barriers had been removed between us and him, why do you keep hanging that curtain back up? The curtain's already been removed. It's, there, there's no barriers in Jesus because of Jesus between you and God. Why do you allow other people to hang the curtains back up? Why do you hang that curtain back up? Let me, let me ask you this way. Why do you allow how you feel in any given moment to be a barrier between you and God? Why do you allow what someone says about you to be a barrier between you and God? Why do you allow your past that's already been dealt with and forgiven be a barrier to you and God? Scripture tells us we can boldly approach the throne of grace, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so my question for you today is this, what is your curtain? And if you're tuning in today in this lie that, that we're addressing that maybe you've implicitly believed is, is that you don't have direct access to God, what is that curtain? What is that barrier that you believe stands in the way of you in God. Now, if you're bold enough, um, I want to issue a challenge. If, if, you're, if you're tuning in today, would you be so as bold to write in the comments what it is that, that, that it's been a barrier between you and God? What has been that curtain in your life? If you could take a moment and write in the comments, maybe you'll find that you're not alone in your own struggles, in your own sort of barriers that you've set up. You keep hanging the curtain back up. You keep allowing someone to hang the curtain back up. But here's what I want you to do. Whatever it is, whatever barrier you believe stands in the way between you and God, I want you to let Jesus tear it down. I want you to bring it before the Lord and I want you to, to see this imagery so strong and so clear that when Jesus died on the cross, the temple curtain was torn in two, thus making a way for anybody who's in Jesus to come to him and have direct access to him. Now, I have a movement. I, you know, we, we sometimes, if, if we were gathering together in person, I promise you this would be a message where I'd make you get up out of your seat and do something. But here's what I want you to do. If, if you're at home and maybe the Lord is really speaking to you in this message and you just need a next step to take, some sort of symbolic action to take yourself to, to sort of make a statement that, that, you know what, I'm allowing God to remove any barrier that I feel is in the way between me and him. What I would love for you to do is to take a piece of paper at your house and maybe write on it what you think that barrier is 
And then just an act of, of letting God tear it down. Take that piece of paper and rip that thing in half going, Lord, that barrier no longer exists. I believe in faith that I can come boldly to your, to your throne. And that is amazingly good news, you guys. Because let's be honest. We so often allow what someone says or how we feel to determine whether we are close or distant from God. But the truth is, in Christ, nothing separates you from him. Jesus never leaves us nor forsakes us. Nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. So I'm telling you, today, if you've hung a curtain up in your journey, if you've allowed someone to hang up a curtain in your journey, I want you to tear it down today. Tear it into, let Jesus tear it into two so that you can boldly approach his throne, his grace. God has made you right. God has purified you. He's consecrated you. You can confidently stand in his presence with no fear of death, with no fear of judgment, with no fear of condemnation. You have been set free. You remember that passage in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12? In him and through faith in him, you can approach God with freedom and confidence today. So I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to pray and we're going to close with one final worship song. But if you're tuning in today and, and you need prayer or encouragement for anything, or if maybe you're tuning in today and you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus, turn your life to Jesus, you're ready to tear down um, a, a curtain in your life, if you will, it's been a barrier, um, let us know, reach out to us, say something in the comments, let us know, we'd love to come alongside you in this journey. But let's pray together and let's worship. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you that in the middle of our homes, our living rooms, our bedrooms, you are meeting with us. Your presence is, is, is moving in our midst. God, I pray right now that anybody who's believed this lie, that they don't have direct, direct access to God, that they would have that lie demolished right now. Just like the curtain was torn in two, God, I pray that they would know that if they have, have, have come to know Jesus, they believe in Jesus, they have absolute direct access to God. May they boldly approach your throne. May they, may they have confidence before you. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for what you've done, for how you made a way for us to be reconciled back to God. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus.
Isn't it amazing that no matter what setting we what setting we find ourselves in, God's word finds us and penetrates our hearts and it encourages us. We hope you were encouraged today through God's word. And I want to invite you, if there's any next step that God showed you or revealed to you during today's service, you can either go to the pursuit.church with all the next steps we have available, or you can email us at hello at the pursuit.church and we love to just be the church, come alongside you, help you continue to grow even in the season where we can't gather together and know that no matter what we're facing, the best really is yet to come.